Gospel for Unreached. Our mission is to spread the good news to the whole world through the internet. Jesus commissioned his disciples to go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Mark 16, 15. Come, let us join our hands and hearts to reach the, the lost and tell them the love of Jesus. Therefore, go and make disciples to all nations. Life-changing sermons in several languages, CD, DVD, MP3, and Bible tracts are available free of cost. And if you would like to learn more and get involved with our ministry or sponsor a missionary orphan, please feel free to contact us by email at gospelunreached at yahoo.com or call us at 310-408-2823. Your comments and suggestions are very valuable to our ministry. We enjoy hearing from our visitors. Thanks for visiting. Please come back and visit us soon. May the Lord richly bless you. Thank you. Luke chapter 11, verse 20. Let's read that together. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Jesus is responding to the accusation of those who accused him that he was using evil powers to cast out demons. In response to that accusation, Jesus is telling them, and any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this, because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub, now if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. In the parallel account in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, Jesus says, the Spirit of God is the finger of God. The Spirit of God is the finger of God. The concept of the finger of God is a concept found in the Old Testament. It was in Exodus chapter 8, verse 18, when the plagues that fell upon Egypt, one after the other, came, the magicians and the people that surrounded Pharaoh told Pharaoh, this is something unusual. This is the finger of God. Heathen, pagan magicians people that were worshipping idols and animals and creation. When they were not able to understand the magnitude of what was happening in that land, plague after plague, a river Nile that they worshipped turned to blood. Frogs they worshipped was everywhere. And things that they could not understand was beyond their ability to analyze and comprehend. And they finally realized this was not something ordinary. This was not something magical. This was not something done by a small demon or evil spirit that we can understand. One magician can understand the tricks of the state of hand of other magicians. So they could not figure this out and finally they exclaimed, this is not an ordinary thing, it is the finger of God. Then when you come to Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, 
we read how the Lord gave the commandments, the Ten Commandments. And who wrote the Ten Commandments? It was the finger of God. It was engraved by God Himself. Engraved by God Himself. When a plague came upon the land and the magicians could not figure out what it was, they knew it was the finger of God, the judgment of God. When Moses went up the mountain and sought the face of God and God gave the Ten Commandments, and God Himself wrote it and engraved it, it was the way that God wanted His people to live. And those Ten Commandments have been the foundation of civilized society. Any society that has violated that, has floundered, has become basically nothing. When you come to the book of Daniel in chapter 5, we read of a king, Belshazzar, that was having a big party. It was a party where everybody was drinking and feasting and just doing all kinds of evil things. And what happened all of a sudden? There was a finger that came and wrote on the wall. And all of a sudden it caught the attention of people because they realized it was a hand of a human. It looked like a hand of a human, but it was a finger of God calling for accountability, calling for judgment, saying, you're weighed in the balance. The finger of God. When you come to the New Testament, you find Jesus takes his fingers and puts it in the ears of a mute and a deaf person. And through his fingers, he brings healing to that individual. And here Jesus says, drives out the demon from a person. And the people are accusing, you're doing this by another evil power. And says, no, it cannot be done. And he says, if I cast out demons... It is a sure sign that the finger of God is at work and the kingdom of God has come to you. In other words, Jesus was saying, a kingdom needs a king and I am the king. When I do something, the kingdom has been established in that place. Jesus is the king and he has come to establish a kingdom in our hearts, in the world. And a day is going to come when he will physically rule this earth. And it will be a kingdom where every nation will bow and acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, just like we sang a while ago. He's the highest, he's the greatest. And it will be an unshakable kingdom, ruled by a person that cannot be shaken. He's not going to be elected. He's going to be a person who will rule with justice. And people will realize what a golden age that is. The finger of God. And Jesus himself gives the interpretation that when the Spirit of God is at work, the finger of God is at work. What do we do with our fingers? Several things and I want to suggest five things. Number one, with our fingers we invite people. We invite people. The Holy Spirit has been inviting people all over the world. Thousands of people respond to the invitation of the Holy Spirit every day. You responded one day to Jesus because He invited you. Come unto me all that are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Come to me. The invitation of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit softened our heart and enabled us to say yes to Him, respond to the invitation. When the pastor invites you for a service, it is the Holy Spirit speaking through Him, inviting you to draw closer to Him. When a friend invites you to a prayer meeting, when somebody invites you to a spiritual activity where you are seeking the face of God, it is the Holy Spirit working through that person, speaking through that person's lips to your heart, inviting you to draw closer to Him. The Holy Spirit is always inviting. Draw nigh to me. Draw nigh to me. Come close to me. Every time you 
hear that invitation, you need to realize the Holy Spirit is at work. He's a God who invites. He's a God with open arms and inviting. And that is the finger of God at work. On the day of Pentecost, Peter gave an invitation. How many responded? 3,000 responded. He gave the invitation. God used Peter's mouth, God used Peter's words, but it was the invitation of the Holy Spirit. And they were convicted in their hearts and they responded to the invitation of the Holy Spirit. The finger of God was at work. More than nearly a quarter million of people or so per day respond to the invitation of the Holy Spirit around the world. Every day, more than a quarter million people come to know Jesus Christ. And they are responding. Whether it's in India or China or wherever it is, they are responding. Through the internet, you go to the Great Commission site of Campus Crusade and you will see on the internet every second you will see how many people are responding from various countries in the world through the internet. Whether it's a Muslim world or from uh, you name it, from all over the world people are responding to the invitation of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is tugging at their hearts and inviting them. What else do we do with our fingers? We write with our fingers. We write with our fingers. So does God. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 2 and 3. He tells the church in Corinth and he's telling us. You are a letter read and recognized by all. He says you are a letter that people read. And people are reading about Jesus Christ through your life. The letter that the people read is not necessarily the Bible initially, but they are reading your life. They are listening to your words. They are listening to how you respond in a particular situation. They are seeing how you behave. They are watching your lifestyle. They are seeing your character. They are seeing whether you keep your word. And they are seeing how you respond to situations. They are reading about Jesus Christ through your life. You are a letter read and recognized by all Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. You are a letter. I am a letter. And that is what Paul says. You are a letter. And who is doing the writing? God is doing the writing. You are a letter. Read and recognized by all. The third thing that we do with our fingers. We grip. We grip with our fingers. So does God. John chapter 10 verse 28. Jesus said. I have held you in my hand. No one will snatch you from my hand. If you are held by God, no one is going to snatch you from his hand. We are held in his grip. We are held by God. Paul said we are sealed unto the day of redemption. We are sealed. You cannot be contaminated. You are protected by God unto the day of redemption. That is the assurance that Jesus has given to us. The Holy Spirit has given to us. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Being gripped by Him. Jesus said, no one can snatch you out of my hand. God uses His fingers. The finger of God is at work. Number four. What else do we do with our fingers? We point with our fingers, isn't it? We point with our fingers. The Holy Spirit is a great pointer. He points and he tells me what to focus on. He will not allow me to be distracted when I, there is a tendency for me to be distracted. He corrects me if I am listening to him, if I am sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He will direct me and say, okay, you are being distracted. Focus your attention here. Don't major on minor things. Major on major things. How often we spend so much of time on trivial things. The Holy Spirit, when we are in His presence and when we are sensitive to Him, He'll remind us, you're spending unnecessary time on trivial things. That doesn't amount to a hill of beans. In the light of the eternity and kingdom, what you're doing now is peanuts, basically. It's nothing. Focus 
on something that matters. There is nothing higher, nothing deeper than Jesus Christ. You believe it? Say a big amen. amen. There is nothing higher, nothing deeper than Jesus Christ. Nothing. Nothing will take the place of Jesus Christ. He is the greatest, he is the highest, and he is worthy of your attention, of your worship, of your reverence. He points me to Jesus always. When he comes, he will glorify me, that Jesus said. That's his job. He is co-equal with the Father and the Son in power and glory. He has the same status. He's worthy of my worship, worthy of my reverence, worthy of my love. And we need to worship Him. He's part of the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But yet, when He works in our heart, the finger of God, He points me to Jesus. 1917 was the Russian Revolution. When the Communist Party upset the Tsar regime and established a communist power in Russia. In 1970, when the Communist Party officials were meeting and planning and scheming and doing all the planning to bring about the revolution, their building was right opposite the headquarters of the Russian Orthodox Church. At the same time the Communist Party was meeting for this particular uh, meeting for their plan to bring about the revolution, the Russian Orthodox priests and the church officials were debating, were arguing and were fighting with each other as to what the color of their robes should be. Amazing, isn't it? Fighting over trivial things. Fighting over things that doesn't really matter. What should be the color of the robes? When one party across the street was planning a revolution and they succeeded. And they ruled for more than 70 years. And killed untold millions of people. And now because of that, it's actually the mafia that rules Russia. There's no law or order. It's the mafia that controls the whole country of Russia. Jesus Christ is the greatest, is the highest name of all. There's nothing you can think that is greater than Jesus Christ. At the end, it is to Jesus that you will answer. You're not going to answer to your employer or your boss or your business partner or your spouse, or your boyfriend, or your girlfriend, in the end, you're going to answer to who? Jesus Christ. And in the light of eternity, what you're doing doesn't amount to anything. So focus on Jesus Christ. So with our fingers, we point, and the finger of God enables you to point your life and make sure that your direction is pointed towards Jesus Christ. And that your life revolves around Jesus. That your life is Christocentric, meaning everything that you do should revolve around His name, His reputation, His glory, His will. Amen. That becomes the passion. For a person who follows Jesus Christ. And when you are obedient to Him, when you are filled with His Spirit, and when you allow the Holy Spirit to work, the finger of God is at work, pointing you always to Jesus Christ. The fifth thing that we do with our fingers is work. We work with our hands, isn't it? We work with our hands. The greatest work is the work of redemption. The greatest work is the work of redemption. And the Holy Spirit is at work softening hearts, wooing people, inviting people. Come to Jesus. Put your trust in Jesus. And give yourself to follow Jesus. And then he uses us weak, weak vessels. He uses us people with all failures, with all kinds of past, 
He uses us to win others to Jesus Christ. The greatest work that you can do is to win somebody else to Jesus Christ. Let me repeat that. The greatest work that you can do is to win somebody else to Jesus Christ because you are enabling that person to be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. You are rescuing somebody from going to hell and now he is bound for heaven. That's the greatest work. That's why Daniel said, he that winneth souls is wise. He that winneth souls is wise. So I want you to examine your life and say, Lord, in the light of your word, help me to understand, help me to cooperate with what you are doing. Help me to do something that will advance your work to win people to Jesus Christ. And next time you take that telephone and make an invitation. Don't think it is just your invitation that you are a spokesperson for God, for the Holy Spirit. And don't think that you are speaking for yourself, but you are speaking on behalf of God. And the Holy Spirit is using your words, your sound to touch that person. The reason that you are here is because somebody invited you. The reason that most people come to know Jesus Christ is because somebody took the time to tell them about Jesus. Somebody took the time to tell them about Jesus. That's why you are here. So you should open your mouth and start inviting people. Inviting somebody for a church where the gospel is preached, where the Bible is taught, is the work of the Holy Spirit. Don't be ashamed. Don't be intimidated. You are partnering with God and the finger of God is at work. And who is the finger of God? The Holy Spirit. Jesus himself told us that. The Spirit of God is the finger of God at work. And when you live a life of purity, when you live a life that is in accordance with the will of God, your lifestyle, people are reading that and people are getting an impression of who Jesus is. You are a letter read by all, recognized by all. The Holy Spirit is at work. And would you say, Lord, help me to understand the work of the Holy Spirit. There are people in the New Testament that were ignorant about the Holy Spirit. Paul specifically tells, don't be ignorant about the Holy Spirit. Don't ignore the Holy Spirit. Become people who understand the work of the Holy Spirit. The Corinthians were ignorant. He says, don't be ignorant. Don't be ignorant. God will call you to accountability. When the Holy Spirit is at work, don't resist the Holy Spirit. Stephen, when he spoke, the Jews resisted the work of the Holy Spirit. Stephen spoke clearly, said, you have resisted the work of the Holy Spirit. Don't resist the work of the Holy Spirit. You cannot resist him, by the way. But if you resist, God will not take it lightly. Don't ignore the Holy Spirit. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Paul, when he writes to the church in Ephesians, the church in Ephesians were known for its doctrine. But they had become lukewarm in their love and they began to grieve the Holy Spirit. You grieve the Holy Spirit when you hold grudges against someone. You grieve the Holy Spirit when you do not forgive someone. You grieve the Holy Spirit when you hold bitterness in your heart. He says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Something that you do. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. When he writes to the church of Thessalonica and Thessalonians, he says, don't quench the Holy Spirit. The word means, if somebody... He's on fire, don't pour water on that person. If somebody's excited, don't dampen that person's spirit. Don't say some crude remark. 
when a person is excited. Don't quench his spirit. Don't suppress his excitement in following Jesus. When a young person is excited about the Lord, don't suppress that person's excitement in following the Lord. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. And Paul, when you read that passage in chapter 5, tells how you can quench the Holy Spirit. He says, you can quench the Holy Spirit by not thanking the Lord. He says, in all things, what? Give thanks. In all things, give thanks. When you stop giving thanks for what God has done for you, you quench the Holy Spirit. He says, rejoice always. It's a command, by the way. Rejoice always. And he says, rejoice always in the Lord. We're not rejoicing uh, for the sake of just rejoicing. We are rejoicing because we know who the Lord is. We know who has written the last chapter. We know what the final outcome is. We know that He is in control. Because of that, we rejoice. Rejoice always. And when we don't rejoice, and when we are not thankful, we quench the Holy Spirit. Paul again says, and when I mean, you read that passage, he says, if you stop talking to God, that means if you stop praying, you quench the Holy Spirit. And then he says, don't despise prophecies. Don't deal with prophecies with contempt. But yet he says, examine everything. Don't deal with prophecies with disdain or contempt, but make sure that you examine everything. If you do not examine everything, if you don't test every spirit, if you don't test every prophecy by the criteria that God has given to you, you are quenching the Holy Spirit. Don't believe every prophecy. There's a lot of foolishness there. Don't believe everything, but we are asked to test everything. So if you fail to test and believe things blindly and foolishly, you are quenching the Holy Spirit. You need to test. You need to use your mind. You need to use your ability that God has given to you to discern. Use the criteria that the Lord has given to you in the word of the Lord to examine whether this is of God. And if you don't examine and believe blindly and follow things foolishly, you're quenching the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit dwindles in your heart, in your life. And you begin to lose the fire in you. That's why many people who follow certain things blindly after a while, they lose all the fervor and they become very depressed and discouraged. It is because they did not examine things properly. They did not evaluate whether this was of the Lord. They were not open to the teaching and the correction of the word of the Lord. They were following things blindly. And if you follow things blindly, don't blame God. Don't blame God. Because wherever the Holy Spirit works, there is joy. Wherever the Holy Spirit works, there is joy. Because it is a spirit of joy that He has given to us. And one of the chief attributes of God is joy. So if there is no joy, don't blame God. Blame yourself. Blame yourself. It is because you have not examined things properly. It is because you have not evaluated whether what you did, what you followed, was according to the word of God. And Paul gives clear instructions to the church of Thessalonica. Rejoice, give thanks, examine everything. Don't deal with prophecies with contempt, but make sure you're evaluating everything, testing every spirit. And that is a command that the Lord has given to us. And then if you don't hear the word of the Lord, you're quenching the Holy Spirit. You hear not only with your outer ear, but you hear with your inner ear. Hearing. How, you remember how many times Jesus has used that phrase, He that hath ears, let him hear. If you have ears, hear the word of the Lord. That is what Jesus was saying. Saying if you have ears, not just your physical ears, but if your inner ear is responsive, and responding, you will understand what I'm saying. He that hath ears, let him hear. And it is only by hearing the word of the Lord that our faith is increased and we understand what God wants to do in us and through us. So don't resist the Holy Spirit. Don't ignore the Holy Spirit. 
Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't quench. Don't pour cold water when somebody's excited. Don't pour. And make sure that what you say to them is beneficial and kind. Remember, the first words that you say to a person is very important. And the last words that you say to a person is very important. God wants to make sure that we don't quench the Holy Spirit. But we keep what He's doing in our hearts alive. And that we grow and we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And we understand when God is at work, the finger of God is at work, it is who is working? The Holy Spirit is working. He works by inviting, by wooing and saying, draw close to me. And he works by displaying his character through my life. And he gives me the assurance that I am held by him, gripped by him. And he is always pointing making sure that my focus is on Jesus. You close your eyes. Would you make a commitment this evening that you will ask the Holy Spirit to guide you into all the truth. Jesus said when he comes, he will guide you into all the truth. But you need to be willing. He's a gentle spirit. He can do whatever he wants, but he knocks and he gently speaks, he invites. Would you open your heart and say, Lord, I want to be guided by the Holy Spirit. He speaks. He speaks very clearly. He does not mumble. When he speaks, he speaks very, very clearly. Would you say, Lord, speak to me. And help me to understand. And help me to hear with my inner ear as well. And help me to be obedient. The Bible clearly says the Holy Spirit is given to them that obey. The Holy Spirit is a holy spirit. It is not just a spirit or an influence. It's a person. The Holy Spirit is a person with intellect, with emotions, with a will of his own, has feelings. And it's a pure spirit. And he will not give it to anyone. He will give it to only those that are obedient. He's more than willing to give that Holy Spirit. And he wants to make sure that we who follow him are filled and controlled by the Spirit of the living God. You say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Will you raise your voice and express that to God out loud for Jesus Fill me with your blessed Holy Spirit. Make that. Make that commitment to the Lord. Lord Jesus, fill me with your blessed Holy Spirit. Continuously, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to understand when you invite, when you are giving that invitation, when you speak to me, whether it is through a pastor or elder or a friend, others saying, come to this prayer meeting, come to this Bible study, and uh, inviting you to be involved closer to God and engaged in something that will en en enrich your spiritual life. It, it, it is the invitation of the Holy Spirit. He's inviting, he's going. And he's asking you to evaluate your lifestyle, your character. Because people are reading your life. And they get the impression of who Christ is through your life. You say, Lord, help me to make sure that I'm living according to your will and your purpose. And to understand.
understand that others are reading my life and getting an impression of who you are. Lord, help me to live a life that is pleasing in your sight. And Lord, help me not to quench, help me not to grieve the Holy Spirit, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Would you take the posture of an upraised hand like this, where you're in a posture like this, where you're with your palms up and say, Lord, I'm a candidate to receive your Holy Spirit. I want to receive your Holy Spirit. I want you to cleanse me with your precious blood. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Would you say out loud, Lord Jesus, fill me with your blessed Holy Spirit. Control me with your blessed Holy Spirit. Use me for your glory. May my life always point. Be focused on Jesus. Father, answer this prayer, I pray, of your children. Lord, we are praying from the depths of our heart. And Lord, we are responding to the nudge of the Holy Spirit. We are responding to your Holy Spirit working in our hearts. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to be vessels filled with your Holy Spirit. Used by you for your glory. Father, may each person here who have heard the word of the Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to work in their hearts. And I pray that you would continue to illuminate our minds so that we can understand the ever-deepening spiritual truths. And our minds are transformed and aligned with the truth of your word. Lord, I pray that you would sanctify and purify our affections because our affections needs to be on things above things that matter, things that are important for the kingdom. I pray, Lord, that you purify our affections and our emotions. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would come and fill our heart with your blessed Holy Spirit. And Lord, reinforce our will so that our will is pliable in your hands, willing to do the will of God and to execute the will of God in our lives. Father, we pray that you come and reinforce our will with your blessed Holy Spirit. Father, we ask your blessing upon all those who have heard the word of the Lord, all those who need to make a commitment. You, have, you are Holy Spirit, you can reveal where we have offended you, where we have grieved you. Lord, help us to set those things right. Help us not to quench, but Lord, help us not to suppress, but help us to keep those things rekindled in our hearts and that our hearts are always on fire for you Lord and thank you Lord for the instruction of your word we ask your blessing upon all of us and Lord as we praise you now we ask that you would uh, listen to our praise of adoration and may we sing from the depths of our heart offer our praises to you and bless and meet every need that is represented here. Lord, we ask that you would come and grip each of our heart and give us the assurance. Amen. Lord, that nothing can snatch us from your hand. We ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to come.